Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. We got a classic today, Ed. One of the uh, the missing links in the history of the graphic novel by one of the all-time greats, Jim Steranko. But let's look at our latest works first. Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing Red Room, my current comics project. I have issue one up there completely available to read uh, at this moment. New strips go up every Tuesday and three bucks will get you the complete archive. Uh, it's a it's a comic made for people who grew up in the VHS era that uh, saw every tape in the uh, horror section. Very much a uh, contemporary outlaw splatterpunk masterpiece. That's, uh, that's goddamn right. My latest, Octobriana, 1976, the world's first blacklight comic featuring the Russian underground superhero Octobriana, is available everywhere comics are, in print or online, uh, through Comixology or my website, jimrug.com. There's also a 350-page process zine of all the drafts, the original art, the the behind-the-scenes, available now wherever comics are sold. Jim, there used to be these books called paperbacks. You could see them at your uh, local news agent. Uh, There was a very popular way to uh, disseminate story. Yeah, and one of the most popular genres, of course, crime and noir. These were uh, books for for men to read. They were popular in prisons, and uh, I love them. Like, I've gone through phases of reading this stuff. There's several generations of them. Raymond Chandler comes to mind as being, you know, one of the the early hard-boiled detective crime fiction kind of noirs, and their legacy continues on today. You know, they've influenced film. They've influenced uh, really all kinds of storytelling. You could look at something like Frank Miller. Uh, you know, isn't Frank Miller without this genre informing him and influencing him? And so it's got this long history. And uh, one of the guys who comes out of that tradition, Jim Steranko. Makes perfect sense, too. And if, if, you, if you know Steranko, and in fact, maybe uh, when you put this video together, maybe you, you pull this off youtube but there's about a one and a half minute video of Storenko promoting like a video made to promote this and uh, you'll notice when you see that video that this is jim Storenko modeling chandler off of himself makes sense so this is uh you know jim Storenko history and in, in comics mostly with shield at marvel comics nick fury and shield uh goes away does a lot of different stuff he's in advertising illustration does paperback novel illustrations does work in hollywood and so he's away from comics for about five years comes back and does this this is 1976 i believe his publication date on this um but it's after about five or six years away from comics but still doing a lot of visual art and influential visual art and so you're going to see I don't know, a more mature version of Jim Steranko, a guy that's very ambitious graphically, often doing things that are new or different in the field of comics. That's most of, I think, his legacy goes back to that. Um, A huge design component. And in this case, really, I think, subject matter and genre that's near and dear to his heart with a format that allowed him to do some different stuff. You can see this is a, you know, kind of that paperback, square bound, 100 and, I don't know, 125 pages. 125 like pages. And this was coming out of a line by Byron Price. Yes. Who had published uh, a couple of volumes previously. I have one of them here in his Fiction Illustrated uh, was the name of the lines. And yeah. they're, they're prototype graphic novels. Yeah. First one was uh, by, by Tom Sutton. Um, this is this is an ambitious format. This is some new stuff that uh, makes perfect. Like one of the... Th- things that comes to mind when I think of Steranko, I think of iconoclasm and, and the format is iconoclastic, you know, like there was, you couldn't point to anything that was like this. I guess the closest thing being earlier and it was sort of a failure in the fifties was the, uh, the picto fiction, uh, magazines that EC did after the horror comics and stuff went away. They would do this kind of like typeset mm-hmm. caption storytelling stuff with like, imagery to go along like I sort of take the panels away um but you know this is incredible and and Storenko is very quick to tell you that this was a fill-in you could you could go through or if there's yeah something I just want to acknowledge that cover because it is something that Storenko became known for these cover paintings oh so yeah. it's cool to see him get to apply this great skill to you know to a book to a complete package like this right and I do think it's striking you know that that lighting that lightning bolt lighting lighting up half of their faces it's a nice image it's it's it's, you know, from a guy who is growing from, from that pulp tradition, and he will use that exact kind of style when he's doing, like, Raiders of the Lost Art uh, paintings and shit. 
an illustrated novel. This is a couple years before Will Eisner comes up with the graphic novel term for a contract with God. Yeah. And so, you know, you often see this kind of um, language, people fumbling around with language. How do we describe this? We don't want to call it a comic. And to be fair, this is, does not look like a comic. No. But it's still a format that doesn't quite exist. You know, like how do we sell it? Beautiful design. Yeah, and Red, right here. Red Tide, the uh, the name of this particular story. I think there were possible plans to do more of these stories featuring Chandler, who is the detective in this. Yeah, and and you know this is this is a, a, a failure, like the, in terms of sell through. Um, I think Sorenko said that there are thirty thousand of these out there in the wild, and uh, many of them were pulped. I wanted to uh, note. So this is volume three here of Fiction Illustrated logo, cover art, book design, typography, Sorenko. The great Storenko. He doesn't say it here, but coloring is also, you know, part of this. Um, he also doesn't say, like, writing. So, you know, I guess these are viewed as, like, a secondary skill, you know, kind of the production side of it, which he, in interviews, talks about the oversight in production that, uh, you know, like, he does all of that, and that's what allows some of the techniques that are going to be on display here, including the coloring that he called, like, cinematic color, I think is what he referred to. But the first thing I'm going to note... This is drawn in pencil. Is that true? That's what he says. And, and the reason is there'll be sharp edges and then there'll be kind of these softer edges. And I guess he didn't think he could achieve that with ink. And so when I read that, like, man, I stare at this thing and I can't figure out that it's that it's pencil. But he says it is. I don't know why he would lie. It's just amazing, like, how flat and even and perfect the lines and everything are for pencil reproduction. But that's part of him doing the production part, you know? It's something that he says he learned how to do from the advertising world, and so he was able to apply it here. That, that's that's incredible. Um, he said, he he also said that he, uh, he did this complete book, this complete package in about two and a half months, and he also says that he sleeps one hour a day and, and runs up a hill uh, 20 miles a day with his pet wolf or something. So, so you know, I, I don't know what to, what to make of that. Uh, but one thing that I do uh, pay cl very close attention to with this is very, very uniform panel composition. It's two panels a page of the same uh, weight and, and, and width and all that. And just look at what this guy is able to accomplish with it. If, if there's 22 panels that always work uh, for Wally Wood, he has 200 panels that always work. There's an interview that I'm going to flip through briefly after this from Dark Horse Presents many years later. And he talks about the coloring and, and, and the influence it had on other people. And that David Mazzucchelli has told him about how this coloring was really uh, profound on him. So worth paying attention to that as we flip through. And in terms of this like layout that you describe, Ed, it's two to one is, is your ratio size. Um, so it's two thirds, uh, is, is art. Yeah. And so he does a variety of stuff with these images, you know, like this first batch of pages, you see it's they're single images. Yeah. But here we see one that's continuity. This is one big image that's still broken up and fits in the page layout, but it's, it's one continuous piece. Uh, almost you can imagine your camera panning across this. Really and, nice, man. These, these are beautiful images. Like it's, it is interesting that he takes... Compare it to like a stray bullets. He takes the same exact size and then he just explores what you can do in that size. Exactly, a, a great rhythm, and it's it's good because uh, the the formal stuff that he does with the comics page elsewhere, um, there is a lot of playing around with that stuff. And and seeing him with a very like kind of like rigid set of uh, guidelines for himself, seeing what he could do with that, um, really illustrates to us like sort of what makes the him sing as a as a illustrator yeah i i think this looks spectacular uh you know reread this this week in preparation it kind of you know like i think writing wise this is right in line with your pulpy crime fiction kind of stuff yeah sure it, it's not uh nothing embarrassing in the text here this is very much that hard-boiled a lot of double crosses, a lot of characters that we'll meet and then we'll learn more about them. And, and, you know, they pivot back and forth as to whose side they're on. Pretty classic stuff in that tradition. This is an illustration job. And, and uh, you know, the magazine illustrators, they take the time. They, they pose people. They, um, uh, they light settings and do all that. Uh, a lot of... Stranko's looking at himself a lot while, uh, while drawing this comic. And a lot of guys do that. Yeah. If you're using models, like, uh, the great thing of using yourself is you're always available. Right. I love all of the kind of, like, the sign stuff. Any of the Night City scenes, I think, are really impressive. 
I found this in the probably mid nineties or so someone or other recommended it. And it's the height of my Frank Miller fandom yeah. and the Sin City stuff. And so like seeing this, it's the same. There's a lot of crossover, you yeah. know, I'm sure that Frank Miller was into this book. Oh yeah. He, he cites Dorenko as a guy. And, and, uh, if he cites Dorenko, it, it ain't Captain America. He's talking about. He's very, uh, he uses that red man for, for very specific reasons. He he doesn't he doesn't use that except for very harrowing kind of violent moments like look at that blood on the ground maybe you know he mentions that he has this coloring technique for this book that's somehow unique and different I don't of, know of, how of course it is I, I I don't know how it's different than the regular comics palette like if you look closely it feels like it's the same he's he's working with the same palette you know you know what I, I when I when I was taking a look at this and I saw some other uh, um, there's the bigger book called Chandler. Um, that, you know, it is this, but it's bigger. And the color, uh, I think it was um, the color uh, Zipatones, you know, the color Zipatone screens, and he's and he's cutting them out uh, that way. These are some great, great illustrations. I love any time you see the shadows behind these characters are always really great. What he's doing here is trying, Chandler trying to get out of this bad guys on either side of him in this yacht so he takes a, a whiskey bottle breaks it with a splatter effect try to splatter as much as he can and then throws his lighter on it and backs out so he basically sets that office on fire and, and, to keep them busy as he leaves and look it wasn't gratuitous like it was a, a tasteful approach man i love all of the signage and everything that's used it feels like a montage like like you could almost hear the saxophone music and and just you know, a newspaper would be spinning around if it was a flick. Love this. You know, you talk about the red, like, being used to really stand out. Here we have a warmer scene, and now the blue is the color that's used to just really pop. And that's probably, uh, Ed, you mentioned the screens. This would be an example of that. Like, if you're doing this yourself, you get to draw these shadows. Right. Yeah, and, and you know, just cut them out. Femme fatale, right? A, a staple of this genre, and of course he's using it. He's got it all. He's got the uplighting. He's got the use of Venetian blinds. You know, the neon signs are important. This is another one of those effects where the image stretches across all four panels. Really great, nice interior design shot of the time. The story of this is that uh, a, a guy comes to Chandler as a detective he has been poisoned, and he wants Chandler to find... He has 72 hours to live. He wants Chandler to find the, uh, the the person that poisoned him. You could find the photograph of Steranko, like, in this pose. I think there may be some other images based on this photo that mm. he does, like covers and stuff. For, right. For, uh... You know, the other thing with him is there's there are books that are talked about that never come out. So I never know if it's stuff that actually exists or if I've just seen like maybe an ad for it and, and maybe it was published or not, but I've definitely seen that image in different places. That's when a Chandler finds out that uh, an old love of his is involved in this. Of course, it's very important. Yes, that, that's your hard, hard-boiled stuff. I love this panel. There's, it makes me think of all the images we see of like subway shots. Uh, you know, if the famous Kriegsteam one from Master Race comes to mind, but it's not the only one. You know, that's a real, uh, if you're doing stories set in New York City, like you're going to have that descent into the subway and, and coming out of the subway. You know what? I just I just remembered. Uh, he said that every image, like every single panel, he uses the uh, like the, the golden circle thing, like uh, with intent. This is funny, too. The, this guy was trailing him. He's a, a cop, undercover cop that's following him and uh, kicks the doorstop under a revolving door without this guy noticing, so he runs <laughs> into the door. <laughs> There's a lot of like little subtle stuff like this. This is beautiful. Unbelievable. The reflection on a wet street, and then you see, again, this is probably that attention to the coloring, where we've got orange, yellows, and magentas, and blues in that street reflection. This is, I mean, this guy, like, you know, he is the original king of kayfabe and all that, but he is an astounding illustrator, man. He had so much fun when he, whenever he's designing anything, like this nightclub with the uh, the mermaid tanks behind the bar. I'm down for all of this, and I love that these people are colored blue. You know, these people are colored greens. Like it's just a really great effect for a nightclub. That looks like Harvey uh, Harvey Cattell. <laughs> yeah, the fixer, the wolf. <laughs> A lot of uh, brain damage suffered in this, too. People are getting hit in the heads with, with blackjacks all the time. Pretty important, man. Gotta get that pistol whip. 
Chandler's an ex-boxer, too, and so uh, he's pretty good with his fists. We see that happen quite a bit. Pretty violent. Piranhas. <laughs> Piranhas. Yeah, it feels like such a trendy thing. There's a there's a there's about a 10-year period where like movies all have the piranha tank in the bad guy's office and somebody's hands going in that. It's in the second, uh, the second James Bond. It revolved around it. Like the hidden <laughs> treasure was hidden under the sand in a piranha tank. You have to do it. This is a cab driver that comes to his aid and doesn't play too big of a role in this story, but it feels like maybe there were plans for her. She has moxie. Yes. She has moxie and an Irish accent. Of course she does. Because I see the red hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. I'm just looking close to see if her last name is Mick something. <laughs> it probably is. Yeah. <laughs> Another good color example of the green versus the flesh color. And and he's going to, like, we're getting into, like, the Outland kind of style. That's a bold, pretty good drawing. I mean, I, I just, Miller is jerking off all over the place <laughs> looking at that shit. You know, this is uh, Ava yeah. and, and Dame to Kill for right there, man. Yeah, you know, like, this is, like, the tasteful approach, and then and then Miller's like, motherfucker, it's 1992. Like, let me, let's update this. There's your outland, you know, with, with the fire escape, where he's doing all of the, uh, all the straight lines and parallel lines and everything. Also, you know, staple of noir, usually it's through blinds, but here we're seeing it through the fire escape. Yeah, just those parallel blacks, man. I mean, look at that. Talk about a descent. It's incredible. And... You know, pretty good body count. Several people killed and, and throughout this, you know, it does keep moving. Having that device of like 72 hours to solve this, we keep getting like chapter breaks, which he, you know, describes as being part of the novel approach to this work and this story. But it does heighten um, e even the rhythm of like the same panel sizes. It does create like this certain like running thing throughout, right. you know, sense of like time is running out. There's a lot to do yet. We don't have answers, and it and it really works for the suspense part. I just I can't stop loving what he's doing in these kind of like foreground is one color, even just like just blue. You know, it's almost a silhouette. It shapes. Jimmy, I'm just real quick going to see like, okay, so like those panels. That's a choice that that. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. That Starenko is making. I just need to make sure of that. Yeah, he invent. This is really Starenko's hand on every page his concept in a lot of ways. And he had worked with Bry Byron Price before on like an anti-drug story, although like five five or six years earlier. So mm -hmm. he had some relationship with him and Price, you know, kind of, I don't know, his legacy, you know, he, he did a lot of stuff with these comics that were outside the norm. Yeah. Um, I don't know, trying to stretch the form. I assume trying to reach some, maybe a wider audience of readers, but just trying to do some things that were different than what was being done primarily in, in like Marvel DC comics. And this is a good example of it. Like this is a pretty exceptional book in that regard for being different at that time. Just great compositions. Composition after composition is strong. Extremely. And, uh, and like exquisite drawings, like in, in every panel. And, you know, once again, it's, it's Starenko. He said, you know, he drew this, he created this, constructed this whole thing in about 75 days. I, I, I don't buy it. I just don't buy it, man. It's very accomplished. Yeah, all of this stuff is strong. And it all reads well. You know, like we saw the Tommy gun here a couple pages ago. Chandler gets hold of this. Monkey's with it. And then uh, that's going to come back. You know, like it's all set up here. There's nothing missing as you read this. <laughs> and there it is coming back. Got him. He put some boat grease in the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this Clark Gable guy ripped right out of 1932. How badass is that for a panel? You know, you're that's really working with that horizontal vertical panel where it's like, I don't know, a third, a quarter of the panel where all the action is and it's back far, it's receding the, into the distance. There's so much to it, man. It's it's the body language is great. That cast shadow is incredible. And the delicate inking on the bricks in perfect perspective. Like, th I mean, this guy is a master illustrator. There's, there's no freaking doubt about it. Yeah, same page. Here we have the lights through the rain, through the windshield, the rear view mirror so that we can see him sitting in the back doing his thing. Inspiring work. Very inspiring work.
Another one of those continuous image, but we get two shots of Chandler because of a mirror. Smart. Good compositions. Everybody has a gun in the climax scene. That is that is your uh, Pulp Fiction 101. <laughs> Lots of guns that we're going to introduce in the beginning of the scene that got to go off somewhere. Look at that shot up glass. Super cool effect. It's it's one of those things, man. I mean, this is a super bright guy. And we were so lucky to have him just, like, even come through comics in any capacity, you know? Um, about the author? It reads like fucking Dolomite, Four man. pages, dude. <laughs> like, like and, and, you know, this is that thing, like, you know, we're in the game now. And early on in your career, when you realize that you're the one that's supposed to write the biography for you on, on you know, whatever, Comic-Con or whatever, he's totally into it yeah writing about himself and it really is it's like you know at the age of one i drank whiskey and gin at the age of two it's I incredible ate the bottles that it came in stranko was born in 1938 a few days after orson welles famous war of the world's radio broadcast years later this is talking about his escape artist Years later, a comic book inspired by his exploits was published under the title Mr. Miracle. Doesn't, yeah, and, and Kay Fabers, uh, is there any evidence out there of Jack Kirby saying in an interview that the comic was based off of Jim Stranko? Because I think he must have known Kirby's demeanor and, you know, he puts that out there. And just knowing that Kirby won't refute it or say anything public about, like, uh, Stranko's full of shit. So I think. That Jim Steranko created that myth until until proven otherwise, and I don't want to hear one comment where it's like, "Well, I heard this." Like, sh- <laughs> like show me the fucking article where Kirby says that. It's this is th- this book. Track it down. It's worth it to read his biography. Man, he needs yeah. to write memoirs. It's my favorite part of this thing, man, because it, it does go along with the stuff that you could find on YouTube, where he's like, you know, I I don't even I all I eat is fruit. Uh, all I eat is fruit. I sleep one hour per day. I run up a mountain with my, with my timber wolf. There's your other uh, fiction illustrated stuff. So Star Fan that we showed, kind of a, a sci-fi piece. Son of Sherlock. I think Son of Forthcoming. Sh- That's a forthcoming one. Is Raven the other? Um, if it's by Tom Sutton, yeah, a three foot tall detective by Tom Sutton and Byron yeah. Price. Yeah, it's the first so one. Raven is the first one. I think only three were were done. I don't think Son of Sherlock ever made it. Chandler, like, lost, you know, they lost their shirt on this one. And I, I wanted to pull this out. This is a Dark Horse Presents Volume 3, Issue 3, and it has an updated Chandler treatment. And what is updated is the art being recolored by Steranko. There's also an interview in here, a couple pages of Steranko talking about uh, both the original and this updated version. So you can see, you know, a comparison of, of the, I don't know, digital color treatment. Yeah, that he's doing. I don't love the digital color treatment, but I think it's noteworthy that, like, you know, here's a guy who continues to push forward Mm -hmm. because that's that's the process with this stuff. You look at early digital art; it's terrible and stands out, and we all mock it. But now, like, I can't tell you the difference. You know, you could show me two pieces of art, and and it'll be a toss up whether I can tell you how it's made or not. So, I commend a guy of his age who's so successful and yet continues to, I don't know, branch out to try to continue to push himself. To see what he can make. Yeah. Um, very weird. Yeah, these are your browns. They, they are. These are your brown panels. They're very muted colors compared to the original, and, and this will be a great example of that. You know, look at even the blue of the suit, much, much brighter in your original version. And then, of course, the gun, almost no comparison between the gun panels in terms of brightness. Yeah. So. Kind of an interesting, legendary work, and, uh, you know, you can find online interviews with him talking about stuff like this. This is one of the significant books, projects that he does in his life. This is another one I'd love to see an artist edition of. Absolutely. I mean, what, what does Spe- this look like in really pencil? pencil? Yeah, it'd be great. Um, but, good looking piece. Reads well. I'm surprised that it did not find an audience. If he had, you know, maybe it was a distribution issue, because it feels like this reads in line with crime fiction. You know, I've read crime fiction from the 70s. It feels like this would drop right in. And certainly, if you were a fan of the older noir stuff from the 40s and 50s, I think you would eat this up. It's that, it's that uh, you know, the visuals and, and, and the, the text. Uh, 
everybody thought that shit is that's the little kid stuff, you know? Like I I had I had picture books, I had freaking Disney picture books that had the exact amount of uh, text as these. So it's like a respectable man, am I going to read, you know, a, a little kid's book just cuz it got a gun? Um it's I I would I would call it ahead of its time. Yeah, I think that's fair. And we're going to look at a few of these books that have like graphic novel outlier kind of qualities this is definitely one of those yeah. and uh, and there's a few of those scattered around uh genre american comics history and most of them are failures <laughs> you know up until i don't know when the graphic novel actually really finds its audience it might be 86 with dark knight and stuff yeah it might be 2006 <laughs> uh, but one of, definitely one of the contributors, I think, to that evolution. Absolutely, man. Uh, get out here, Jimmy. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when the next vids are available. Octobriana, in stores now and on Comixology. Get it while it's hot. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor is where I'm serializing Red Room. Issue one's up there now. Three bucks get you the archive. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist K Fabe e newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with. Whatever we are doing, you can find cartoonist kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Jim, over there, look, man, it's that Matt Baker graphic novel. Let's go check that out. Give them the merchant orders. Read more comics.